you've sold the book. They can do that for 15 pages. Now, does that mean you have to compromise your voice, your vision, and your style? Yeah, sometimes. But that's the skill of writing. You're there, but you're using techniques which we know rivet the person. So if we look at Enid Blyton, I just found this in the back. Let's look at the opening. Anton Chekhov is a more literary example of this. It's, it's chapter one. Mother, mother, where are you? shouted George, George rushing into the house. Mother, quick! There was no answer. Where's the mother? Mm, what's, what's, yeah, maybe. <laughs> what's going on? She's actually picking flowers. Oh. But, um, um, Suspense. Yeah, I mean, you need, to, you need to convince the reader that they have to spend eight hours with you. Mm. Uh, so as whereas a story might be important to you, that's fine. But you have to somehow make it important to the reader. Um, so the first story I ever sold, uh, you know, um, started with something ridiculous. I'm so ashamed to tell you. <laughs> but it started with something like, my wife is deaf. We've been married for 20 years, and today I'm leaving her. Mm. And everyone's like, wait, 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 why are you leaving? Why is she deaf? Like, what's going on? So, um, it was me experimenting with that idea that commercial fiction writers <coughs> rely on very heavily, which is to, from the first page, you're like, well, this the writing's not very really good, I'll just see what happens. It's <laughs> so why you stay up at 12 o'clock watching bad movies. You just want to see what's going to happen. Um, so now if you can apply that commercial writing technique to your literary style that is like no one else out there, that's how you, that's how you get a book published, really. Um, so a lot of uh, first books I, you know, I, I have to edit, uh, the first, it's too much backstory at the beginning. Mm. Now backstory, Neil Gaiman told me that backstory is normal when you're writing a first draft. Uh, because you're telling the story to yourself. You're trying to figure out kind of what happens, you're feeling your way through. Uh, so a first novel will might be like 70-80% backstory. Um, but then by the time you've got a draft that you want to send to agents and editors, the book should be 70-80% on what Nabokov called the surface of the present. Now what do we mean by the surface of the present? We mean this. Um, Mother, mother, where are you, shouted George, rushing into the house. It's happening right now. It's in the past tense, yes, the simple past tense. But we don't know where the mother is. You're right, well, she's dead. Um, uh, what if she's being, like, you know, carried off by a bear? And um, mother, mother, where are you? It's urgent. Oh, what's urgent? You know, so it's happening right now. Timmy is hurt, said George, with tears in her voice. Oh, the writing's terrible. But this has sold 10 million copies because of Timmy being hurt and the mother's nowhere to be seen, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that you'll sometimes pick up a book and you'll be like, how on earth did this get published? My writing is better. And that very much might be the case. But writing and writing a book are different skills. So if you can figure out how to write a book and then incorporate your brilliant writing style, that's how things come together. Um, so, a lot of new books, though, I find that, you know, unpublished books, it's like, you know, George had lived in Manitoba for eight years. His neighborhood was, it's all backstory. Backstory is boring because it's passive, because there's nothing happening. It's not happening right now. We could learn all this later. Do you see what I mean? So, it's very important to start your books on the surface, what Nabokov said, on the surface of the present. Something's happening right now because it feels unresolved. Because then the chemical in our brain is like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here, what's happening? Am I needed? You know, it's like an emergency. Um, so if you drive past a car accident, okay, you're not like, no, I'm not interested because I don't know who anyone is. No, I don't know how it happened. But you drive past a car accident and it's grisly, it's like this. Oh, you know, you can't get enough. So that's what you really have to do at the, uh, at the beginning of, of a novel start off on the surface of the present, get rid of backstory, but in an early draft, backstory is normal. 80% of the book being backstory, normal. And so I want you to think in terms of drafts, not books. If you say, yeah, I'm writing a book, 
you will work on that book endlessly. But if you say, oh, I'm writing draft one, I'm working on draft one, okay, good. You've got seven months to finish that. And then from seven months to ten months, I want to see draft two. From ten months to thirteen months, I want draft three. And then we'll be getting ready to start submitting. The magic, what may, will make your work truly brilliant, happens between draft three and draft four, usually, or draft four and draft five. But when you think in terms of a book, it's chaos, because one part of the book is draft four level, another part of the book is draft one level. Do you see what I mean? So get through draft one, you've got the bookends, it's right there, a complete thing. All right now we go through, we've got something. Yippee. And then we go through draft two, and it gets better and better. And then draft three, you're ashamed of draft one. You put it in someone else's trash can. Um, but the problem is, if you think in terms of book, you come to draft one, and you're like, I've written a book. But the thing is, that book might turn out to be brilliant. But you'll never know, because your goal was to write a book. You see what I mean? But your goal should be to write a book in ten drafts. And that, that feels laborious. But actually, if you think in terms of drafts, you'll write a bit quicker. Because if I say to you, we have to walk 100 miles tomorrow, okay, but I, I really just want you to write te walk 10 miles. See what I mean? You're the pole, you're past the 10 mile mark. And you'd be like, oh, we're stopping? I feel great. <laughs> and if I say tomorrow, I want you to walk 10 miles, by mile nine, we'll all be like, you know, in Lord of the Rings. Um, so. I think thinking in terms of drafts rather than thinking in terms of a book is very important. Uh, now some people say the difference between a short story and a novel. Well, in my experience, a short story is heavy on tone, uh, whereas it's a place for your style to really come out, your voice really to shine. Um, there is usually no character development in a short story. It's about one thing. A couple in the bedroom looking for their marriage certificate to renew a visa or something, realizing that they can't find the marriage certificate mm -hmm. and also that they've grown apart from each other emotionally. That's it. That's the story. They never leave the bedroom. They're in their pajamas. That's it. There's no character development. We're just watching. Um, and um, a short story is a dripping of a faucet and somebody laying away, remembering an uncle in Brazil who taught them how to tie their shoelaces and to swim. And that's it. A short story, when people write short stories, they usually try to do too much. It's one thing. It should be as spare as possible. The first draft should be no more than five pages. And then you can maybe edge it up a bit more. Now, most people, and then short stories are not hard. Um, all you have to do is just be very, very spare. It's like, you know, if you have a dinner of one thing, you know, like very strict vegans, sometimes they'll serve you one thing. Here is an eggplant. You know, but it's, it's cooked in such a way, you know, so um, that's a short story. It's tonally consistent, you know, but you'll never, ever, ever forget that eggplant. Um, whereas a novel, the main difference is there's character development in a novel. So a novel is like, a, a, a chain of pearls. Each pearl is a chapter, and, he, and, it, and um, each pearl is a chapter where something happens that leads us to the next chapter. It's like Jenga. If you take out chapter two, the whole thing should collapse. But if you've written a first draft and you take out chapter seven and it's still standing, well, you don't need chapter seven, you see. So uh, a novel is character development. So once you get you know, 30, 40, 50 pages in, emotionally connected, to the, um, to the characters, to the story, which is someone else's story, but it's really your story, okay? Then, and you start to plan, then you start to draw the pearls. Okay, so I'm probably at about like chapter four now, free writing, you know, 30, 40 pages. So for the next 10 chapters, she's gonna to go to the supermarket and then she'll see the homeless person who she realizes is the father she hasn't seen in 15 years. Okay, so then the next chapter is where she tells her mother. And then the next chapter, so every chapter should follow on to the next until we have a big finale. You know, we've all got so used to thinking that it's more artistic to have a, 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 
an, an ending that is both pathetic, uh, that is, uh, what's the word looking for? That is sort of a, like a French film, where you know, a French film from the 60s, where the ending is, you know, they just they drink a coffee and say, oh, c'est la vie. And that's it. And that's the end. You know, and you're like, wow, that's so artistic. Wow. But really, that's not that effective for the reader. You know, you want an ending like Stephen King used to be very good at endings in, in his early books. Um, James Joyce is brilliant at endings in his short stories, the Dubliners. Mm. So you want your book to build and build and build to an ending that is just unbelievably memorable. The arc then is coming at the end, the emotional arc. You see, um, it can't. Otherwise, it can be. If you don't allow each chapter to build to the next one, it becomes too much of a soap opera. He said, she said. You see, uh, and if there's any scene or chapter you're writing, you're like, oh, you know, they have to have to have this scene, but it's very boring. That's you don't need that scene. Anything you think is very boring when you're writing it, don't write it. <laughs> Move on to the next one, and then when you finish the first draft you'll see an empty chapter, just go back and now you'll know how to fill it in or shuffle things around. But it's very important that you think first draft, first draft. Deadline for a first draft, May the 1st, because that's when I'm going on holiday, so that'll be a nice reward. Um, don't think about, don't judge your work when you're not at your desks. A lot of writers walk around, you know, stop and shop, like this, <laughs> you know, or always crab it. But uh, unless you're at your desk and you can actually do something about it, it's good if you think your work is bad, because it means your sensibility is you're trying to get it better. Your children think everything they do is great, so they improve in a very slow... You see they're developing confidence at that age. But, um, so it's good if you're critical about your work. But um, you know, if you get to a point, I knew an Ox Oxford professor who was working on the same novel for 10 years, and I said, give it up. Like, give it up, it's done, it's, you, it's dead. And he said, no, 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 I need to keep working. And I said, but the thing is, five years ago, you had a book, right? But for the last five years, you haven't been making it any better, you've just been making it different. They had a radish for dinner and not a cucumber. The reader doesn't care about that. So the reason that he kept rewriting it, obviously, was because he was afraid that if he tried to publish it, he'd be rejected. And so it was really not a problem of writing, it was a problem of self-esteem, you see. And he was, I said, you're an Oxford professor, for God's sake. But of course, people who have low self-esteem, they, they could have the Nobel Prize and they'd still feel like shit, <laughs> you see what I mean? So um, that was that problem. So you get to a point where you've written something or you've painted something and you're not making it any better, you're just making it different. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's when you need to call in an editor. Um, don't trust family members to read your work. If I give something to my wife and she says, oh, well, I don't, I'm like, what? How could you say that? We live together. My confidence is shattered. But if she says it's good, I'm like, well, you have to say that, you know, you're my wife. So you really, really just trust, trust editors, um, I'd say. Um, let's see. So that's the difference between short story and novel. And then the last thing I'll say, and then I'll let you go, is, um, and then if you have questions, I'm open to questions as well, and if Penny has a question. The last thing I'll say is, um, is in a first draft, you're going to be doing a lot, I know it sounds elementary, um, you're going to be doing something called um, telling instead of showing. Um, so telling is, is good for a fine for a first draft. Neil Gaiman, his first draft, it's all backstory, and telling. They go into the graveyard, um, the people who've been there for 20 years, actually that some people have also been there for 80 years, so he's telling the story to himself, right? Um, and then once you get into the, after the first draft, you kind of get some semblance of the story, and the second draft is about the structure, and then the third draft is about refining your language, your tone. And that's really where the magic happens. If you think your first draft is good, you wait until the fourth draft. <laughs> You'll reveal parts of yourself you never knew were there. Um, so, uh, you know, you go in and, and uh, you're telling things. So, let me give you an example of telling. This is, for, say, from a hypothetical first draft. The old man walked up the train steps and sat down 
and pulled out a photograph of his dead wife and cried. Right, that's telling. This would be showing. Um, Morris wobbled up the train steps, pushing hard on his kid. So we don't say it's an old man, it's a person, Morris. We don't say he's old. We say he's pushing hard on his cane. He's wobbling up the steps. See, we're showing the reader's like, oh, he's old. He's got a cane. He's wobbling. You see what I mean? Um, he found a seat, slowly, people behind him sighing. We don't need to say sighing impatiently. Impatiently would be telling. Sighing, oh, they're impatient. That's what literature is. It's the pleasure of autonomy on the page. So the reader figuring it out, that's the joy of it. Um, uh, he finds a seat. After the train starts moving, he rummages in his pocket, pulls out a black and white photograph. The photograph is of a woman when she was young. He touches the hair of the woman in the photograph. Period. He touches her lips. You see? So we know that this is somebody he loved. We don't need to tell the reader. He takes that picture of his dead wife and like cries. So in a first draft you will have he takes out a picture of his dead wife and cries. But in the fourth and fifth draft, he takes out a bent photograph, touches the lips of the woman portrayed, touches her hair, looks at it, period. You see the difference? So telling is fine in a first draft. So if you don't think in terms of drafts, the problem is you'll have a novel that you've been writing for two years. Some of it will be showing, some of it will be telling. It will be in a bit of a mess. You see what I mean? It's like serving a dinner, and some of it's raw, and some of it's cooked. And So it's very important that you think in terms of, of drafts. And don't worry about feeling like you're failing. It's normal. We all feel that way. You won't feel good until you get least into the second or third draft. You just have to have an enormous amount of faith that it's going to be something and you have to keep going. Um, any questions? Well, I would, I, sorry, this is so, so interesting and wonderful. Well, I'll ask you that in six months. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I presume this is probably for fiction writers more than what I'm doing, which is writing sort of a collection of memories about my own childhood for my family and my kids. So it, it's s sort of a memoir, I guess, it's kind of a portrait of, of growing up in early, the early years of my growing up. Right. So I would like some You have to tell them as stories, though. I, I hear you. I mean, and creative nonfiction. I mean, you, you tell, um, so what happened to you, say, when you were five, you know, instead of, I was five when I was given, it would be, my mother called me and I went down the stairs. The house was, so it's really happening. I mean, in a way that seems kind of pretentious to me because I was given this job, you know, and I, it, it seems sort of like showing off to, to try to make it into literary piece when I'm not charged with that in a way. I mean, I don't know. Okay, so I'm listening to you and I'm hearing what you're saying, so. Um, I don't think, I don't think you could write anything that wasn't literary, and that might be a problem. Is that you want it? You, you're trying to, you're trying hard for it not to be literary, when naturally your your style is literary. You've given me a lot to think about. Well, good, good, Thank good. You. Yeah, welcome, Penny. And you know, to be continued. <laughs> you can always email me if you have Thank any you. questions. Any other questions? Yes. It's not really a question. It would be, I'm more fascinated by the idea, like we judge. Oh, this was such a good writing day. This was so marvelous. But then in the editing, you don't know the difference between the good days and the you know the lesser days. Right. And like I've, I'm a theater person, so I have the same experience hearing like actors get off stage and saying, "Oh, that was such a bad. I what I wasn't feeling it tonight." Mm. But the audience doesn't know the difference, you know. But you think it's so you know such a big difference, you know, so obvious to observers. Yeah. That's just that's interesting to me. This, this idea, like when it feels on versus off, but does right. an observer know? Right. And when you're being paid to write, you know, say you have a book deadline, you know, you have to keep going because your editor wants the book. But before you're published, 
you know, if you have an off day, it might throw you off for a week or two. Mm -hmm. And that's what derails a lot of careers, you know, as they're getting started. Um, can I just, just want to interject for one moment, because um, I, I welcome 